All right, so we have an anchor verse. If you're new to Hope City, I like to have an anchor verse that ties a bow on the entire weekend. Here's where we're going to start today. The book of James, chapter 1, verse 22. It's on the screens. But don't just listen to God's word. You must do what it says. Ooh, that right there is enough to just Okay, that's a humanity piece. It's like, I get it. I like to listen. Some of y'all have that you version, and you're like listening to the Bible while you're driving, and it's in like a cool British accent. But are you a doer of the word? It says, don't just listen to God's word, but you must do what it says. Otherwise, you are only (laughs) fooling yourselves. Let's pray. Father, give us ears to hear today. Most importantly, God, we need a heart. We're going to be talking about a heart posture today as we unpack today's parable. But God, I thank you today for the power of your spirit. So Holy Spirit, convey to us the things that are hidden that you desire to be revealed. And I said this last week, these parables, as ancient as they may be, yet still powerful and relevant today. God, I thank you that your word has no expiration and that it's still alive and active today. We're ready to receive. If you're ready to receive, shout amen. Let me give a little more groundwork. Uh, I did this last week, but for those of you who maybe were not a part, the parable series is all about this. All throughout the Gospels, we see that Jesus spoke in what are called parables. They're stories that run parallel to a deeper spiritual truth. So Jesus, full of wisdom, with a profound understanding of the way a human heart and mind comprehends truth, chose to speak in parables knowing that spiritual lessons needed to connect not only with our spirit, our heart, our soul, but he also needed to connect it in a human way with an earthly lesson. Parables, again, are meant to demystify the supernatural by drawing a parallel with the natural. So here at Hope City, if you're new to Hope City or you've been around Hope City, you know your boy loves this to share stories. I love stories. I feel like that's the way the Lord connects with me through parenting, through being a husband. I love to tell stories. So if you're like, well, I'm not really into stories, then you may not like me. All right, because I love to tell stories. You can laugh. It's okay. You're going to like me. Okay. So for week two of parables, last week I preached on the parable of the lost sheep. This week, If you want to take down notes, we're going to be talking about the parable of the sower. Parable of the sower. The story of the parable of the sower is actually talked through by Jesus in three out of the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. But for today, we're going to be reading and focusing out of the book of Matthew. Now, in this parable, Jesus begins to unpack how people receive and respond to the message of the kingdom of God. Now, there's going to be some heavy scripture reading. We're going to be reading out of Matthew chapter 13, 1 through 23. Again, we are a presence-driven church, spirit-filled, but we're also a Bible-based church. You're not just going to hear one verse and a bunch of fun stories and make you laugh. (laughs) That guy's crazy. I love that. No, we're actually going to read through the word. Amen. Come on, somebody say, I'm ready. ready. Y'all awake? All right, say, I'm ready. All right, here we go. Matthew chapter 13, verses 1 through 23, that same day. Jesus went out of the house and sat by the lake. Such large crowds gathered around him that he got into a pontoon, I'm just kidding, a boat, and he sat in it while all the people stood on the shore. There was a hunger. And Jesus felt the crowds, another translation talks about how the crowds were pressing in around him to the point where he ended up retreating to a boat and said, all right, I'm gonna gonna go and teach you. There was a hunger And Jesus began to share this parable saying, a farmer went out to sow his seed, and as he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came up and ate it. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up, but because the soil was shallow, when the sun came, the plants were scorched, and they withered because it had no roots. Verse 7 says, other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked out the plants, Still other seed fell on good soil. Somebody say good soil. soil. And it produced a crop of 160 and 30 times what was sown. Verse nine, whoever hears, let him hear. The disciples came and asked him, well, Jesus, why do you speak to these people in parables? He replied, because the knowledge of the secrets of the kingdom of heaven have been given to you and not to them. See, the disciples walking with Jesus, they had revelation knowledge. 
There's a difference. I said it in the opening verse. There's a difference between just being a hearer and actually having revelation. I talked to a gentleman in between services, and he said, man, I got... I committed my life to the Lord when I was 18. I got baptized, and I don't know what happened. I just ended up going down a wrong, the wrong path and doing my own thing. I, I honestly, Pastor, I didn't have ears to hear. I heard it, and I even I thought received it, but I didn't really have revelation knowledge of it. Verse 13, he says, "This is why I speak to them in parables: though seeing they do not see, though hearing they do not hear. In them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah." You will ever be hearing but never understanding, seeing but never perceiving. For this, people's hearts have become calloused. They hardly hear with their ears, and they have closed off their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn. That's the thing about sin. He said, go and sin no more to the woman who was caught in adultery. Part of Going and sinning no more is not that complex. It's literally the turning away, the trajectory you were going. You say, I don't need to be held captive by that anymore. And he said, if they'll turn, I would heal them. But blessed are your eyes because they see and your ears because they hear. For truly, I tell you, many prophets and righteous people long to see what you see, but do not see it and hear what you hear, but do not hear it. Verse 18, he says, listen to what the parable of the sower means. And he begins to break it down again. When anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one, by the way, there's a real devil who really doesn't like you. Some of you are like, good Lord, coming in hot. <laughs> no, there's a real enemy. Just like we preach that there's a real God who loves you and he's a personal God and hasn't ran out on you and he has chosen you and he'll forgive you and restore you. But there's also a real enemy who really doesn't like you and recognizes that you're dangerous. Recognizes that if you'll catch the revelation of God's word in your life, not only will you recognize there's healing in your hands, but you'll recognize who you are and whose you are. I'm preaching better than you're responding. <laughs> Guys, come on. That's ridiculous. I'm just kidding. No, but the enemy knows if he can, I've said this for years, if he can deceive you long enough and convince you to give up, throw in the towel, not fulfill the assignment on your life, not only does he rip you off, but he rips all the people off connected to your purpose. See, the thing I love about Hope City is this is a church where purpose comes alive, where you can walk in one way and leave with the deposit and say, I'm ready to take on hell with a water gun. Come on, somebody. When anyone hears the message about the kingdom and doesn't understand it, again, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in their heart this is the seed sown along the path. Verse 20, the seed falling on rocky ground refers to someone who hears the word, receives it with joy, but since they have no roots, they last for a short time because when trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. How many of y'all have gone through some stuff? Wave at me. Come on, you've been through some things. We're all gonna deal with it. The Bible says that the rain falls on the just and the unjust. We're all gonna deal with stuff, but if it, falls on rocky ground, you may receive it with joy in one moment. Let your light shine, let your light shine brighter until my bills are late. <laughs> now, for real, though, let your light shine, let your light shine. Why don't you have your flashlight on until the diagnosis is read? No, no, we live in a world where persecution, struggles and brokenness, Jesus himself in John 16, 33 says, in this life, we're all part of this life, you're going to have stuff, struggles and trials and sorrows of many kinds. But Jesus said, but take heart because I've overcome the world. And if Jesus overcame the world, great news is you can overcome the world. Somebody should shout, that's for me. That's for me. Verse 22, the seed falling amongst the thorns refers to someone who hears the word, but the worries of this life the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word, making it unfruitful. This is where it shifts, but the seed falling on good soil. Somebody say, I'm good soil. I'm good soil. Even if you don't believe it, prophesy it, I'm good soil. It refers to someone who hears the word, grasps it, understands it. This is the one who produces a crop yielding 160 or 30 times what was sown. The parable of the sower. It's funny, when you talk about sowing, people in instantly tighten up. They're like, well, he's going to talk about money. I'm not talking about money at all. This is about the seed from the Word of God 
and how we respond and receive it in our hearts. So we're going to put a magnifying glass over this, dissect it section by section, like we did during week one of Parable of the Lost Sheep. So the first seed, the seed throughout this entire parable is the Word of God. And the first seed we're going to look at, the seed on the path, it represents the hardened heart. The hardened heart. The seed on the path represents the hardened heart. Matthew 13, we're going back to it, dissecting it. Verse four, as he was scattering the seed, Jesus talking about the farmer, some fell along the path and the birds came and ate it up. So again, the seed throughout this entire parable is the word of God, which by the way, the word of God is always on time. The word of God is constant, it's consistent, and it's consistently unchanging. If you only came for this right here, you may want to take a picture of this. The effectiveness of the seed depends on the condition of the soil, not the seed itself. I'm going to say it again. The effectiveness of the seed depends on the condition of the soil, not the seed itself. Elbow the person next to you and say, what kind of soil are you working with? What kind of soil are you working with? Because what about a hardened heart? where the seed just kind of laid on the ground, the birds came and ate it up, and there might have been some cracks where the seed got in, and maybe there was a little bit of growth, but now the effectiveness of the seed fully depends on the condition of the soil, not the seed itself. I come from a long line of farmers, my cousins, my uncles, my grandpa, my great-grandpa, a bunch of farmers. <laughs> and my grandpa would argue while he was alive that the most, the most essential part of the farming life the farming journey was not the harvest season. We all want that. No, he said the most essential part was making sure that the soil was right before we ever put a seed in the ground. And there was, there was a season, ugh. If you have a garden, where's all the gardeners at? Come on, people that are like, oh, I love the garden. She's wearing a glove. She's literally wearing a garden glove. It's amazing. She's like, I'm out here in the garden streets. No, garden, it, gardening is tedious. It's pretty boring. You stir up the dirt and plant seeds and then <sighs> wait. <laughs> In the farming world, there's a season that's not the harvest season. It's frustrating. It's tedious. It's boring. It's, it, it, it's, it's mundane. It's just plowing and stirring it up, clearing out rocks, pulling up weeds. Ooh, but then when you do it right and you have cultivated the ground right and you're working with good soil, oh yeah, then there's a, there's a season called the harvest season. How many of y'all like the harvest season? Come on, that's like, that's like the payday season. So what kind of soil are you working with? Because again, the effectiveness of the seed depends on the condition of the soil, not seed itself. There's two types of people that walk in here every week. And if you're joining us online, thank you. Let us know where you're tuning in from. We have people in the nation, literally all over the world that watch thousands of people every week. But if you're in the room at one of our campuses or here at West Houston, there are two types of people. I've seen it now for over 22 years in ministry. I've seen it where two people, will, they can literally be standing in the same row and we're worshiping. You are my firm foundation the rock on which I stand. And this one person is getting set free. They're letting go of anxiety and depression. They're casting their cares on the Lord. And they walk out the same doors they walked in, marked by his presence, and they're bragging. Girl, you listen to me. I got a deposit today. God healed me. He delivered me. He set me free. That person has the soil of expectation. They walked in with expectation, which by the way, the atmosphere of expectation is also the breeding ground for miracles. So when we unite together as family, whether you have mustard seed faith or you can move a whole mountain, we, we, we need expectation. The same, same row, person next to him could be like, I don't know about this. I'm not really impressed with that new song. The guy with the yellow, Travis Scott's, I mean, he's an okay preacher. This isn't really connecting with me. A lot of times that person is more in a spectator posture. And they don't have the soil of expectation. So I ask you again, what kind of soil are you working with? Last night, my wife, she knows Saturdays 
around five o'clock, I'm like, hey, babe, I need to like take a breath because I'm pre- you know, we preach marathons here on Sundays and and uh, we're just we're busy. And I said, I, I need to take a breather. And she's like, that's fine. I just kind of need you with me because I'm going to plant an apple tree, a blueberry bush, and a blackberry bush. <laughs> Y'all, this is, a lot, this is a lot of work. So I'm out there like, what are we doing? She's like, well, first we got to, she's digging and we're chopping through all kinds of vines. We're getting everything ready. And y'all, the tedious side of, of topsoil and compost. And then we planted it. We realized something was wrong. We had to dig it up and do it again. And it was all kinds of work. And I woke up this morning just like, oh, Lord. Like, But the truth is, if we want those trees to flourish and those blueberry and blackberries to produce, the soil and the condition had to be right. Everything in life the culture says now, no, you got to rush it. You got to get yours. You got to make sure that door opens. You got to make sure that you are in the right place at the right time. And I do believe right place, right time. But the truth is you can't microwave spiritual maturity. There is something about repetition and discipline daily in the presence of God. Last night we, we were with the kids at the pool and my son, a bracket, he's 15 and he's at 18 months old. They told him he was probably going to be, they told us that he was probably going to be about six, seven. And he's grown like crazy. He's like, no, I'm going to be bigger than you. I was like, but I can dribble with both hands. Um, I'm just saying. But he's 15. He has 15 year old sort of conversations and stress. And then we got Fox. Fox is five. And Fox sees no hierarchy. He will figure out how to tackle his 15-year-old brother and thinks he can win. He's all boy. He's intense. And I'm watching them. Fox's concerns are different than Brecken at 15. But this morning when we woke up, if Fox was the same height and was five years old to 15 years old, we'd be questioning, whoa, 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 what's going on? We'd be running tests and trying to figure it out why. Because in life, specifically with growth and spiritual growth, we have to have a mindset of seed before speed. Because once you put that seed in the ground, it's not about just having a harvest the day after. No, it's spending time every day in the presence of God and saying, God, pour out your spirit. Give me a little bit more of who you are every day. I can't handle it all. I mean, Moses was like, show me your glory. We, We wouldn't be able to handle everything that God has for us and has planned and prepared for us if he tried to reveal it all to us right now. That's why it's so important to trust him even when you can't track him. That's why it's so important to plant seed every day and allow the presence of God to water it. Spend time in his presence. Are y'all getting anything out of this? Spend time in his presence every single, every single day. So what kind, of, what kind of soil are you working with? We went to Honduras, San Pedro Sula, Honduras, and we were invited to lead worship at this, this huge youth young adult conference. And we were excited. We're going to Honduras, and we didn't know anything about it. And they advertised this as the Great American Rock Band, which was hilarious. So people all over Honduras was like, I'm going to hear Ben Helen. And it was me. Um, so, so we're showing up to lead worship, and we're showing up to preach. And we land, and y'all, it is, they are so kind, They're the kindest people. And they pick us up in this kind of caravan. We have like armed security. I'm like, is that really necessary? They're like, yes, sir. They called me Bishop the whole time, which was really fun. Um, I tried to get Jackie to call me that, and she's like, not going to happen. So, so we land, and I love, I love names. If you're wearing a name tag at a restaurant or you're a barista, I will, as fast as I can, figure out your name. Like, hey, thanks for the latte, Lindsay. And she's like, oh, how'd you know my name? <laughs> like, well, you're wearing a tag. It says Lindsay. She's like, oh. How's it not that? <laughs> so we, la- we land, and we're, we're, we're picked up by this sweet lady named pa- Pamela. And her tag says, Pamela. And I said, Pamela, it's so nice to meet you. And she said, Bishop, let me just clear this up. It's Pamela. <laughs> I said, uh, yes, ma'am. And she was a little spicy. She said, it's Pamela. She did with a little bit of a, and I was like, okay. And I said, I get it. I get it. It's, it's spelled, it's and I get the, okay, Pamela. So I said, my name's Daniel, like D-A-N-I-E-L, but I go by Devante. <laughs> and she was like, that's cool, Bishop Devante. And she's like, why? Why do you need to do that? Read the room. That's not even, wasn't a necessary joke. It's spelled Pamela, but the pronunciation is 
Pamela here. I was like, I got it, but I was trying to be funny. Anyways, so they take us to our spot, our place, and she's like, Bishop Devante. <laughs> she's like, we'll be here at four. Be ready. And we're like, we're going to be ready. Y'all, it started to rain. And I'm not talking about like, like a little drizzle, like oh, a little Honduras afternoon shower. It was a monsoon, like streets flooding, people running for their lives. It was awful. And we're stuck. And they told us they'd be there at four. She said, we'll be here at four. You'll be ready. I was like, I will, Pamela. I'll be here right now, prayed up and ready. They showed up at 7.20. So they said, ah, Honduras time. I'm like, okay. So 7.20, they pick us up. Y'all, the windshield wipers are struggling, can't even cut it. And there's no speed limit in San Pedro, none. You have to buckle up, click it or tick it, like all that stuff. But she was driving like a bat out of Birmingham. I mean, weaving in and out of traffic, blowing the horn. We're like, dear Lord. Like, we did not come to San Pedro Sula Honduras to die. Like, this is not why we're here. And she's driving. She's missing cows. And I'm like, Pamela. And she's like, yes, Bishop. I'm like, can you slow down a little bit? She's like, no, we have to get there. We have to get to the arena. They're waiting for you. And I didn't realize that the question I was about to ask would be so hurtful and loaded. And I said, Pamela, it's raining so hard. Like the roads are flooding. Will anybody even be there? And y'all, I don't mean like a little teardrop, like, oh, beach up. <laughs> she started sobbing, like wiping her eyes while the windshield wipers are not working and weaving it out. Like, and she's like, what did you say? I was like, I don't know. I just, she says, you messed up her name again. I'm like, I don't know. And I said, Pamela, why are you crying? And she said, well, I don't know if I understand the question. I said, okay, let me help you. In America, not Hope City, but in America. <laughs> if it's raining this hard, we'd probably have to cancel because the streets are flooding. I mean, if we opened up the doors, we would maybe have 10% of our church show up that are just the diehards. Like, i got to give me some worship. <laughs> i got to hear a word. That's awesome. I love our church. But in America culture, I'm telling you, Pamela, nobody would be there. I'm so sorry, but will anybody be there? And she turns and I'm like, Pamela, watch the road. She's like, Bishop. I'm like, Jesus, take the wheel then, because Pamela doesn't have it. She looks at me. She was coming down her face, and she said, I heard the question. This marked me. Yo, it marked me to the point where when I tell the story today, I remember it like it was yesterday. She said, the reason I'm so troubled by your question is they have been there for days. And the storm had been brewing and rain had been falling and the winds were 60, 70 mile an hour. We pulled up to the arena and not a couple hundred, I mean thousands of people were huddled up against this building. They had the soil of expectation being cultivated. She said they've been there for days because they need a, a redeemer. They need a miracle. They need a breakthrough. Bishop, they need hope. People have walked for hours and days to even try to get a glimpse of the presence of God. And I mean, I was, we were moved with emotion because I said, God, ignite that type of fire in our nation. Ignite that type of fire in Houston at our Katie Richmond campus, at the Woodlands. Lord, ignite that type of fire where we will get up and not be inconvenienced because of the heat. That we will get up and we will show up because we believe that the word of God is alive and active and he has something for us. And y'all, we saw 1,642 commitments to Jesus in that one service. You didn't even know the weather was unraveling outside. They gathered there for days. Elbow the person next to you say, what kind of soil are you working with? Because again, we're all a work in progress. None of us have arrived. None of us have instantly made it. No, no. All of us should be growing every day. There should be repetition, daily discipline, daily surrender. This is essential to us growing every day. Again, the seed is the word of God in this path, the path in this first point. The path represents people who hear but don't fully obtain it. And this path in the parable is like 
would be considered like a dry place, like hill country, or if you've ever been to Phoenix in the desert, like it's hardened ground. It's been hard for years and years. Like rain hasn't been able to get through to it. And when it does, it just kind of soaks it up. The dry place is a, is a hardened place. So when the seed or the word of God, if you have a hardened heart, begins to land on your heart and it's hard or it's calloused, it can't ever fully take root. So when we first started in ministry, like the San Pedro Sula Church, I, I actually started in music. And I've actually told this illustration before, but I've never actually uh, done the illustration. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to thank you so much. Give it up for our team. So when I first started in, in music, um, I remember I sat down with my guitar teacher and I so desperately wanted to learn how to play and I start playing it. Uh, it just was so painful. And I told my mom, I was like, hey, I don't think I, I'm cut out for this. And she was like, oh boy, you better get in that room and practice. I'm like, okay. So I remember sitting down and I remember playing for hours and my fingers would hurt so bad. And my guitar teacher was like, listen, you're going to have to develop calluses. You have to develop calluses so when you begin to play, he said, when you begin to play, I don't need all that. <laughs> it's ridiculous. He said, if God's called you to lead and he's going to bless you with the opportunity to lead people into freedom, you can't play for 10 minutes and be like, oh, my fingers are hurting. He said, no, you need to be able to. Play, sir. He said, you need to be able to. Water you turn into wine. Open the eyes of the blind. There's no one like you. There's none like you. He said, you need to be able to play. And then sing, sing. Our God is greater. Our God is stronger. God, you higher in the other. Our God is healer, awesome in power. Our God, our God. He said, you need to be able to lead people. And he said, but this is really important. You need calluses on your finger, but never let calluses get on your heart. Because he said, as you're leading people into a place of freedom, if you're more concerned about what they're thinking, you'll never take them to a place that you're not yourself. So you need to, out of the overflow of your worship time with the Lord, you need to be able to be able to worship and lead them into a place of freedom, but never get up there and just play out of your gifting. That's counterfeit. He said, get up there and lead them out of a place of anointing because you've been with Jesus. Never let calluses. Come on, give God a hand. Come on. And I've learned throughout the years that I can't allow calluses or hardened places in my heart keep me from receiving what God has for me as a husband, as a dad, as a leader. Because the reality is this. Years will go by. They say that the days are long, but years are short. Years will go by, and you'll be like, I should understand why I'm not connecting anymore with the heart of God. Because when seed falls on hardened hearts, calloused hearts, dry ground, the evil one can come in and snatch and grab a hold of and eat that good seed that's laying on the ground. So throughout our journey of planting these trees, Pastor Jackie's like, hey, we need some more grass in this area. I'm like, let's get some sod. She's like, no, I'm going to scatter it. <laughs> so she's out there just like, she's not, but you're not up here. It's kind of like that. You're just like a little bit. Anyways, there's some hard ground and a lot of that seed just laid there. When it rained, it washed it away or birds or raccoons or something comes and eats it. But there's a few areas where she stirred up the ground, cultivated the area, and that area is starting to grow because, it, again, 
the seed that fell on the hard ground, the hardened places, it never could fully take root. So if I passed out a questionnaire, which I'm not going to, some of you are like, dear Lord, I'm not going to ask you a questionnaire, but I am going to ask you this question. What's the condition of your heart right now? Are you sitting on hardened, a hardened heart, a, a calloused heart? What's the condition of your heart right now? Is it shapeable and moldable and pliable? Or would you say now, Pastor D, to be honest, my, heart, my heart's a little hard right now. Maybe you've had a crisis of faith. Maybe, maybe somebody invited you, you came back to church, but you're still a little unsure, which by the way, thank you for showing up. Give yourselves a hand. I'm glad you made it. Towards the end of the service, we did this last week. We're going to do it again. We're going to worship. And when we're in his presence in just a few moments in worship, I want you to do a self-examination of your heart and say, God, is there any area of my life in my heart specifically where I'm resistant to your word? And then we're going to pray for openness and understanding so that God can chip away and break up the calloused, hardened places in our heart. Come on. Somebody say, I receive that. Come on. So the first one, we talked about a hardened heart. The next one is this. You can take a note. The seed on the rocky ground, yeah, that equals a shallow heart. This is a superficial faith. This is where you receive it. The Bible says in Matthew 13, verses 5 and 6, some fell, the seed fell on rocky places where it didn't have much soil, so it sprang up quickly. This is the whole microwave maturity thing. It happened quickly, but because the soil was too shallow, when the sun came, this is for the Houstonians, the plants were scorched and they withered because they had no roots. The rocky ground represents where we receive the word with joy. That's why I, I teach our kids all the time. We're going to have youth camp coming up. By the way, parents, if you have junior high or high school age, we still have a few slots left. Uh, what is it? July 30th through August 1st. We have youth camp, and I love youth camp, but I remember being at youth camp and being like, I love Jesus, like snotting all over your friend. You're like, I love you. We've grown together. And then on Monday, we're like, I don't even like that guy. And then like you, because it just, it just kind of ended up a wonderful moment, but because it was on shallow ground, it ended up being superficial. So when trouble, when persecution when people at work are like, oh, really? You go to church? And you're like, nah, not all the time. <laughs> Sometimes, I mean. No, no, we end up almost hiding our faith. We end up almost ashamed of our faith instead of recognizing, no, no, I, I'm a king's kid. I'm a daughter or a son of the living, a living God. So this is why we challenge y'all every week in our incredible church community the importance of deepening our faith daily. This is why I do the first 20 challenge. If you're new to Hope City, the first 20 challenge is the first five minutes in the word, next five minutes in worship, next five minutes in prayer, and the last five minutes simply remembering all that God has done for you so the enemy can't dupe you into believing that this is where it's over. Instead, you're like, no, nah, no, my God's been so much better, and him and I have history, so I can give him praise because I know where he's been, and I know where he's taken me through, and I know where he's going to lead me to next. And so we, we challenge you to deepen your faith. That's why today we're kicking off, I mentioned it earlier, but we're kicking off the summer semester of HC groups. If you've never been in a group before, I want to challenge you, get in the summer semester. We have a group for everybody. We got groups where people are working out. We got coffee shop groups. <laughs> That's something funny and I didn't say it. Anyways, no, we're going to different coffee shops. We got basketball groups. We got all kinds of groups. People that just want to just read the Bible together. Amazing. There's a group for you. Go to hopesy.com slash groups. And throughout the summer, don't recluse. Don't pull back, but press in and continue to deepen your faith. I also love, love, love. Probably my favorite thing we do is our midweek chapels. If you've never been a part of one of our midweek chapels, it's at 11 a.m. to 12. It's one hour. One hour of power, brother. No, it's take your lunch break and join us. It's upstairs at our offices. It feels like an upper room moment, and God breathes. How many of y'all have been to the, the midweek chapels before? Y'all, it is... It is phenomenal. It's kind of a smaller, intimate gathering. I know a lot of you are like, well, I work. I can't be all up in the presence of God then. Well, maybe you can ask your boss if you can have that day off. All right, men's breakfast. Everybody say men's breakfast. Actually, not everybody, just the men. All the men make some noise. Come on. Whoa. 
we got some work to be done. Yesterday, we gathered across all of our campuses the second Saturday of every month. We're gathering now, West Houston, Katie Richmond, Woodlands, and we're gathering and we're eating, we're eating brisket tacos together and hanging out, fellowshipping, and we have a strong word. It's happening the second Saturday of every month. This is another thing to deepen your faith. Pastor Jackie filmed seven weeks for the W Collective Media-Based Bible Study. Ladies, if you haven't already gone through the seven weeks, you need to do it. This is something, again, that keeps the soil of expectation cultivated and stirred up. So we've looked at the hardened heart. We've looked at the shallow heart. This is the last one. Write this down. Number three, the seed among the thorns is a distracted heart. Now, I preached on distractions during our Habits and Rabbits series. You can go back to our YouTube channel, but this is key. Matthew chapter 13, verse seven, other seed fell amongst the thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. The thorns represent the worries of this life, the distractions of life. The thorns are designed to choke out the word so it can be ultimately unfruitful in your life. I just don't feel like I'm walking in the fruit of the spirit. You need to check and see where the condition of the soil of your heart is. Because if the enemy is able to get in there and weeds are growing and it's choking out the good fruit in your life, Again, this is why, as a church community, we remind you almost every week to stand up against the schemes and guard against the schemes of the enemy. I said it earlier, but the enemy doesn't like you. He wants to rob you of your assignment. He wants to rob you of your joy, because if he takes your joy, he takes your... Come on, Bible students. Nehemiah 8, 10, the joy of the Lord is your... So if he takes your joy, he takes your... I thought this was Hope City Presbyterian Academy. I, y'all wake up, my God. No, the enemy knows. If I can trick her with this thing, if I can dupe him with this thing. See, in my family, uh, addiction is a big deal. I mean, addicted to everything. Everything is, a, so, so gambling, all that stuff is a big deal. So you know what I do? And you know what I set up as a boundary in my life? Y'all, I don't gamble. You don't even scratch that ticket. No, you can do that. I can't do it. Because if I win $4, I'll be like, ah, uh-huh. and I'll be behind a lot more. <laughs> so I've recognized the schemes because the enemy knows where you're weak. He knows the bullseye, but he also is real, real, real slick about trying to trip you up. And there's no new demon factories. The same tricks in the Bible are the same tricks now. That, that Jezebel spirit back in the day is the same Jezebel spirit that we deal with now. The same tricks of the enemy that robbed people of their faith then are the same tricks of the enemy now. You have to recognize it and put up a guard against the enemy. The Bible's super clear about it. Proverbs 4, verse 23. Guard your hearts every third Tuesday. Guard your hearts. Say it out loud. Above all else. Above all else. You know, that's, a, that's a pretty high priority in your life. Guard your hearts above all else. Why? For it determines the course of your life. And a guarded heart looks like a receptive, undistracted heart. Now, the last part that I want to land on, and then we're going to have Hope City Worship come out. Say out loud, prophetically declared over your life, I want to be good soil. Matthew 13, 23, but the seed falling on good soil. Oh, I love it. Refers to someone who hears the word and understands it. This is the one who produces a crop yielding a hundred 60 or 30 times what was sown. In a fruitful life, good soil, the soil of expectation, a fruitful life affects not only you personally, but it's like a domino effect. It also impacts others around you, your family, and ultimately glorifies God. Because catch this, the seed falling on good soil refers to someone who hears the word, but also applies it. James 1.22, back to our anchor verse. But don't just listen to God's word. You must do what it says. That's a choice. Otherwise, you're only fooling yourself. Would y'all stand to your feet? I preached this message, this specific message a few times. Not this one, but the one I'm about to reference. I talked about checking for weeds every day. Y'all remember that message? How we need to, because weeds oftentimes in a garden or in a field or when my wife is planting things in our yard, weeds will often disguise themselves as good fruit. And even a weed starts as a seed. 
But we have a responsibility to check for weeds. Some of y'all haven't checked for weeds. And I'm not talking about checking for weed. Y'all need to throw that out. <laughs> it's ridiculous. Now, is there anything in your life? What, look at me real quick. Is there anything in your life that's uh, causing a hardened heart? Is there anything in your life that's causing a shallow, superficial faith, a shallow heart? Is there anything that's causing a distracted, distracted heart? Is there anything that the enemy has had a foothold in? And maybe you haven't cast him out and asked him to flee from your life. Is there anything that's putting a lid on your ability to grow in the things of God? Is there some rough areas of your life and you're like, Pastor Daniel, I just, I feel like I've been overtaken by these weeds. And the truth is I, I don't have a soil of expectation because I haven't plowed it in a long time. Maybe it's a relationship that got in and you haven't, you haven't gone back and stirred up the ground to make sure that the seed from God, the word of God, that's supposed to be active and alive in your life. Maybe you haven't checked your soil in a while. This week is a great wake-up call. What is the condition of my heart? Would you close your eyes just for a moment? And I want you to ask yourself, what's the condition of my heart? What's the condition of my heart? Where am I at right now with my journey with the Lord? Again, this isn't a microwave maturity moment. This isn't a have it your way, quick, instant gratification moment. No, no, this is a, I want to grow God. And even if it's baby steps, every single day, I want to grow a little bit more. I want to grow a little bit more. I want to grow a little bit more. Would you lift your hands open-handed like this, which is a posture that says, God, pull anything out and pour everything in that's you. Pull anything out, God, that's not of you and pour anything and put a deposit in God. Pull anything out, God, that's not of you and pour everything that is you in. Come on, will you just begin as a daughter and a son, begin to say that to the Lord God. Do some cultivating in my life right now. Stir up the soil, stir up the soil. I feel God in this moment, I'm telling you. Some of you are coming back to the Lord and you've been away for a while. Some of you have gotten caught up in the prodigal life and you've been doing things in your own strength and it's caused a heart and heart. It's, it's caused a shallow heart. It's caused a distracted heart. And we're about to jump into this song. And I need y'all to lean in and press in as we, as we sing this song. Because we're going to talk about the rock. We're going to talk about Christ being our firm foundation. And I'm telling you, freedom is in the room because Jesus is in the room. So right now, God, our hearts are prepared. Stir it up, stir it up, God, in our lives. Yes, yes, yes. Christ is my firm foundation, the rock on which I stand, when everything, oh, I've never been more glad, I've never been more yeah. glad, that I put my faith in Jesus. Shout this out right here. Say, He won't. Never will he won't fail. He won't fail. In 
Break up the hardened places, the, the shallow places, the, the distracted places as we trust you, knowing that you will never fail. Come on, if y'all believe that today, you got something out of this word, can you give God praise? Beautiful. If you're in the room or you're watching online, you can say, Pastor Dano, here's the truth. I don't know Jesus as my Savior. I'm going to give two opportunities in closing. The first is you don't know Jesus as your Savior, but you want to. The Bible says in Romans 10, verses 9 and 10, that when we confess with our mouth and believe in our heart that Jesus is Lord, we will be saved. He's going to write victory in your story. Now, I boldly say this. We are not a universalistic church. We do not believe that all gods lead back to one God. We believe that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, the only way to the, to the Father. And the access we have to relationship Oh yeah, it's all tied to surrender. Jesus hung on that cross, gave up his life for you because he said you were valuable and worth it. So that's the first invitation. I want to know Jesus as my Savior. We're all going to pray a prayer in just a moment. Maybe you're the second invitation. Maybe you've gotten caught up in the prodigal life and you're like, hardened heart, check. Shallow heart, check. Distracted heart, check. Pastor Daniel, I got caught up in the prodigal life. I've been living reckless. I've chosen my own path. And today the Holy Spirit has drawn me in and I want to rededicate my life. I want to align my heart back to his heart. We're all going to pray. All this costs you is surrender. Don't take any money. This is a moment between you as a daughter to a dad, a father to his son. Can we just lift our hands one more time and just thank him for the moment in his presence where Lives are about to be transformed in such a way that it's going to change 
legacies and change the, traje the trajectory of families and marriages. And you can put your hands down. I'm gonna count to three if everybody would just hear this. If the Lord is stirring in your heart, one, I wanna give my life to Jesus for the first time. When I hit three, I want you to boldly lift up your hand if this applies to you. Two, Pastor Dana, I wanna rededicate my life. Today is my day, this weekend is my weekend. Three, if that's you, would you lift up your hand? I'm looking all over, I see you and you and you and I see you over here and there. I see you over there, my friend. I see you back there and there. I see you in the middle. I see you, I see you, my friend. I see you over here. Come on, Hope City, can we give God praise for everybody who said, today's my day. Now watch this, we're all gonna pray. So to the 13, 14 people that just lifted up their hand, nobody will feel uncomfortable. Let's all pray this prayer confidently as King's kids, as daughters and sons of God. Say this out loud, Jesus, here I am. And here's all my trauma. Here's all my sin. Here's all my shame. Here's all my condemnation. Here's all my struggles. I'm asking for forgiveness. And I repent. And I'm thanking you for forgiving me of all of my sins. Thank you for hanging on the cross, giving up your life for mine so that I can live a life free, full of hope, full of life, and full of joy. From this moment on, I'm choosing to walk with you. You are my Father. You are my Savior. You are my Lord. In Jesus' name. Come on, Hope City. That's a really great place to make some noise.